Hi there guys, Tom Quayle here. Hope everybody's doing very, very well out there as ever. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. And first of all, I wanna say a huge, huge thank you to everybody who sent me such amazing, kind messages over the past couple of months when I've been on somewhat of a musical hiatus. Needed to take a break just because, you know, the last two years or year and a half have been absolutely crazy. So to anybody who saw my post on social media and sent me a message or just generally was very supportive, thank you so, so much. That's really, really appreciated. Feeling much, much better now, so I'm totally ready to get back into producing content. So let's get going with today's video, which is part two of my sort of how do I practice, what do I practice kind of setup, if you like. And this one is gonna present you with five different tips for legato playing. This is something I obviously practice a huge amount, and over the years, I've developed some things that I like to think about, which are on the more advanced side of legato playing. So this is not gonna cover the basics of the technique, any of that kind of thing. You can find that all over the internet. This is gonna cover five more advanced practice tips to do with psychology, to do with approach, just generally how you can practice this technique to get to that more advanced level and be more consistent in your playing and also improvise more consistently utilizing this technique. So without further ado, let's get going with tip number one. So this first tip is about the psychology that you have or the mental approach that you have when you play with this technique, or in actual fact, any technique. This could apply to any technique that you are using in your playing, not just legato. And this is to think strong, but not tense up. It's the psychology of being ready to succeed, if you like. Now, if you think about the analogy of athletes, so let's take a 100 meter sprinter like Usain Bolt, somebody incredibly successful in their field, if not the most successful sprinter ever. All of these athletes, no matter what they're doing, whether they're a footballer, sprinter, you know, basketball player, playing the NFL, whatever, they are just as much working on their psychological approach as they are their physical approach or the physical needs of their actual discipline, if you like. Now that's no different with music. When someone like Usain Bolt is preparing to go to the Olympics or whatever the kind of competition he's you know, running in, half the battle is the psychology of having a positive attitude and feeling like you're going to win. And that is for the whole part of the race. It's the, it's the pre build up to the race. It's going up to the track. It's getting down on the blocks, getting yourself in position and then visualizing that whole race. You know, you, you hear runners, athletes generally talk about visualizing a game, visualizing a race generally in terms of succeeding. So visualizing that perfect start, the reaction time out of the blocks, visualizing you, yourself accelerating with the perfect technique down out of that first sort of quarter of the track, then getting your head up, you know, really getting that technique, but being super relaxed, so being strong, uh, technically good, but being relaxed all the time. And then powering through, imagining yourself in front of everybody else, accelerating away from everybody else, and then crossing the finish line. Now this analogy, this psychological approach to succeeding, or this psychological approach to having good technique, good form, executing well, is really, really surprisingly powerful when it comes to playing a musical instrument, in this case, the guitar. And it's actually really applicable to a technique like legato, where you do need strength, but you also need to be very relaxed, and you need to be graceful, you need to have good technique generally. If you envisage yourself as finding this technique, legato in this case, obviously difficult. It's a tense thing, your body tenses up, you're, you're visualizing yourself failing, you're visualizing yourself finding it difficult. It won't come as a surprise to anybody that you then do find it difficult. Now, a little caveat here, in no way am I saying if you can't play legato and you've not practiced your technique, that just visualizing yourself being able to do it is gonna make you able to do it. This again is at a slightly more advanced level where when you can execute the technique reasonably well, this is about consistency. Imagine your fingertips like ballet dancers' feet or like touch typist's fingers, dancing across the fretboard lightly, but with lots and lots of control and accuracy and actually envisage this in your mind. So as you're playing, none of your fingers are lazy. None of them feel heavy. None of them feel tense. You're, you're visualizing this in your head. So that when it comes time to actually pick up the guitar and play, when you place your fingers on the fretboard, no matter what it is you're going to play, let's say I was in F sharp Dorian. When you actually place your fingers on the fretboard, imagine that sense of control, strength, but lightness of touch, 
and consistency, gracefulness, not heavy fingers, not tension through the hands, not tension through the body. Just imagine that process. Imagine how good it's gonna feel when you get all of this stuff right and the whole thing comes together. And then when you start playing, try to concentrate on this. It's almost a little bit like mindfulness or meditation. When you're practicing, this is something you can try to keep consistently in the front of your mind. Because if you just think about it at the beginning and then let it go, it's going to disappear very quickly and it's not gonna be at the forefront of your practice. Now obviously this is not something you're gonna do when you're playing live or if you're recording or you're just jamming and having a good time. But when you're practicing, you can keep this, so you can keep this in the front of your mind as a sort of present thought that you can work from just to keep the hands controlled, relaxed, but strong. Think that strength of, of, of approach and fingertips. I realize to some of you, this might seem kind of a bit a bit woo, if you like, or a bit wishy-washy. But this is actually something that you can work on. You can practice thinking in this way, this positive thought, uh, to help you get more out of your technique. And again, this is not something you're gonna be able to do just off the cuff if you can't play legato to some reasonable degree already. But it's gonna help those players out there who've developed some technique, but are finding that it's not consistent and that they're having, they're having trouble um, you know, executing, say, in a live scenario or in a recording session, or just generally having consistency in their playing. So place your hands on the fretboard, pick your harmonic area. In this case. Okay, and I'm gonna envisage lightness. I'm gonna envisage kind of strength, but control, if you like. Then I'm just gonna play. And as I'm playing, I'm keeping that in the forefront of my mind a little bit like if any of you've done any mindfulness. You're, you're trying to concentrate on what it feels like to just be present in the moment. And it's the same thing here. Try not to let your mind wander. Try, try to think about just that positive sense of execution, that positive sense of uh, you know, technical approach. It, it should feel easy, it should feel light, it should feel comfortable, sorry for my notifications. Uh, and if, it, if you can get that down, this is really, really gonna help you in your playing generally with any kind of technique. So with that said, let's move on to tip number two. So tip number two is to always be in control of your time. Now this is generally something that guitar players think about quite a bit, but they tend to not think about it so much with legato. And this is being in control of your subdivisions, but specifically in this case, I wanna talk about something very precise that I practice. And that is to be in control of improvising a certain number of notes within a phrase while I'm doing legato and being in control of stopping and starting in exactly the right place. So this is gonna be quite a specific version of being in control of your time, okay? But generally, just always be in control of your time, be in control of the subdivisions that you're playing, be able to switch subdivisions uh, from you know triplets to eighth notes to 16th notes to 16th note triplets, of course, depending on your level and the, the tempo that you're playing at. But this particular tip is based on something very specific that I practice that I don't see a lot of other people practicing, which is, as I say, to play specific length of phrases with a certain number of notes in, to improvise those phrases using legato technique, and then be certain that you're stopping and starting in the right place, okay? So this can be very, very straightforward at first. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna imagine a scenario where I've got eighth or 16th notes, depending on the tempo, so an even subdivision. Let's say we've got 16th notes, and our tempo is dagga, 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 dagga. Very, very straightforward kind of uh, approach. Now, some of you might find this difficult to play legato at this tempo. Now, that, that's just, it's a good thing to practice anyway. However, what we're going to practice here is we're going to take a specific number of 16th notes and then improvise or construct phrases in a certain harmonic area based around that number of notes. And this is gonna force us or constrain us into a specific rhythmic grouping that we have to learn to be able to manipulate on the fretboard using legato technique. Legato is particularly difficult for this because we tend to stick to certain numbers of notes per string and we feel like a phrase has ended when we've played the maximum number of notes or one time through a pattern on that string. So a pattern might be like, We tend to get stuck in these patterns and we don't finish the phrase in the appropriate place rhythmically. We finish the phrase in the appropriate place physically when we get to the end of the pattern. Okay, and that might not be the correct place rhythmically to resolve our phrase. 
Let me try and demonstrate what I mean. So let's take nine sixteenth notes, okay? What this is going to give us, if we think about standard 4-4 four, four time or common time, we've got one, two, three, four, one E and the two E and the three E and the four E and the one. If we think about that as our, our subdivision grouping, if we play nine sixteenth notes, we're going to get two beats, so one E and a, two E and a, and then our ninth note is going to be the first note on beat three of the bar. So one E and a, two E and a, three. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a three. Okay, so we just need to retain that piece of rhythmic vocabulary in our mind. It's very very simple. So dagger 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 da, dagger 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 da. Okay, one E and a two E and a three. Keep that in your mind. It's very straightforward. What we're then going to do is we're just going to improvise phrases. So this is why this is a bit more advanced because you need the fretboard knowledge, based in a certain harmonic area. Okay, so I'm going to pick, let's say, C Lydian. Here's the scale. And I'm going to improvise. Dagger, 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 da. Dagger, 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 da. Using legato technique and try and come up with phrases. So it might sound something like this. One, two, three, four. And... And. And. So I'm trying to be specific there, starting my phrase on beat one of the bar and finishing on the third beat of the bar. Now this is one example, it's an arbitrary nine note phrase. Let's now do a 17 note phrase. Okay, this is harder to keep track of. You could do any number of notes within the phrase. So I'm now gonna go dagger, 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 da. Two, three, four. Dagger, 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 da. If you count those notes, there's four, 16th notes per beat, so we've got 4, 8, 12, 16 for the bar, and then beat 1 of the next bar is our 17th note. So dagger, 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 da, 2, 3, 4, dagger, 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 da. Again, the important point here is that I'm forcing myself to start and stop in a particular place and then improvise using legato technique, okay? And again, this is tricky because it forces me out of stopping, uh, of using patterns to play. I have to think about the rhythmic nature. I can't just cycle and get lost within that pattern. I have to specifically think about dagger, 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 da. Dagger, 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 Okay, so let's go back to what I roughly our original tempo. So dagger, 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 da. Okay, you can scale this up tempo-wise to whatever you need to use different subdivisions. But for our example here, I'm using 16th notes and I've got 17 16th notes. So one, two, three, four. Two, three, four, and. Three, four. Two, I'm trying to think lightly as well. So that tip from the fir that first tip. Two, three, four, and. Two, three. Two, three, last one, and. So you can do this with any rhythmic grouping. So what you want to do now is go in and do 15 note phrases, odd phrases, or 13 note phrases, or start on beat two of the bar and play a 17 note phrase that finishes on beat three of the next bar, for example. Do this with drum loops or do this with a metronome. The only reason I'm not doing this with a metronome now is because it makes the video a little bit easier to shoot, of course, um, and I want to get this out as soon as possible for you guys. But do this with a metronome. Now, a quick tip, a sort of, 2B, if you like, tip, 
is if you get lost within the rhythmic framework that you've set up for yourself, let's say you've set up a 15 note 16th note phrase, or 15 notes in the phrase, using a 16th note subdivision, and you can't keep track of those 15 notes, write them out in your DAW. So write out using kind of a like a, a snare, or well, probably not a snare, a hi-hat, write out those 15 notes, and keep them, loop that section around in your DAW, and then you've got a rhythmic reference point to play from, and you can check whether you're getting it right or not. And that's a really, really useful way of practicing, to use your DAW as a reference point for making sure you've got those rhythms right. Now, I will do a separate video on that, so that you can see that um, in the next video that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you how I practice a lot more of my rhythmic vocabulary for legato and just general improvisation. But for now, that tip of, uh, being in control of your rhythm, being in control of your subdivisions, and also being in control of the length of your phrases. The world is your oyster with this exercise. Go away and use different subdivisions and make specific length of phrases, okay? And then improvise with those phrases exclusively until you feel like you've got lots of rhythmic control over them when you're improvising with your legato technique. So let's move on to tip number three. So tip number three is all about developing your raw speed. And a lot of the problems that people have are actually physically getting started and going bang, straight into the phrase, and being able to execute rhythmically accurately at high speeds. And you can get good at this using two different approaches. The first is to use what you might call bursts of speed. And this is where you just start and go as fast as you possibly can but have a very specific end goal, okay, or end rhythmic point. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take an A Dorian scale at the fifth fret of the low E string, and I'm gonna play this phrase. Okay. So that is basically playing up the scale. When I get to this fifth fret on the D string, I'm gonna go up to the ninth fret and then come back down to the seventh, the root note. Okay, so I'm basically doing a little enclosure around the root note. And this is gonna be played legato, so I'm gonna go pick, hammer, hammer, pick, hammer, hammer, pick, hammer, pull off. Okay, now, if I wanna play this fast, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off by doing some bursts of speed. And the first thing that I'm gonna do is do this string cross, the first string change here. So I'm gonna imagine those first four notes, I'm gonna make sure that I know how I'm gonna execute them. I'm gonna have that presence of mind to think this is gonna be easy, it's going to feel good. And I'm just gonna execute like this. I'm not gonna have a metronome in there. I'm just gonna play the, the first note and then execute the next four up to this fifth fret on the A string as fast as possible, but as accurately as possible. <laughs> So, what this is doing is it's developing my ability to start the phrase and continue it accurately. There's no stutters, there's no fingering issues. I'm not worried about how good it sounds at this point. You can hear I've got a bunch of delay on there. It's quite hard to accurately hear how good it is. It's more the process of bursting into the phrase. Again, if we use the sprinting analogy, it's that launch phase, that kind of reaction time, and being able to get straight into the phrase with no issues, no errors, no kind of, all the ones and zeros in my brain are actually working properly and firing off um, in an in a accurate manner. So again, make sure that when you're doing this, although it's hard to hear the specifics of, of the phrase, make sure you can hear each note and that you're not fluffing anything, that you're not sort of, it's, it's hard for me to demonstrate kind of doing it wrong if you like, but I'm sure you're aware of what I mean. If you can't hear notes or if the fingering's not accurate, make sure you're using the fingertips, make sure you're you know, thinking in terms of that ballet dance or uh, touch type analogy. You're strong, but you're not tense, and you're, you know, you're utilizing you know, the accuracy there. You can hear there with the, with the, um, the overdrive off or sorry, a clean tone. Okay, what we're now gonna do is we're gonna add in the next note of the phrase, okay? So. Again, try not to tense up here. Try to feel relaxed and keep adding in. And you're not doing this with a metronome, this is a burst of speed. Mm -hmm. 
Now adding the next note. And as you're doing this, if you feel yourself tensing up a lot, just stop, come back, relax, and then try it again. Don't lower the tempo, because the idea is you're bursting into this, okay? We're not worried about the accuracy of, accuracy of subdivision here. We're worried about those twitch fiber muscles being able to, to fire off as quickly as possible. Okay, let's add in the next note. Okay, I feel like I have an issue there. And I can feel myself tensing up. So I would need to take that and, you know, walk away for a little bit and come back to it later. And maybe just do this for a few seconds at a time. As soon as you start to tense up, back away. You know, don't, don't continue because you'll just start building tension into your hand. And then add in the last note. Oops. Don't do this for, as I say, more than a few seconds at a time because you are going to build tension into the hand. This is all about that starting point of firing off those fast twitch muscles. And this is why you wouldn't practice this with a phrase any longer than this. You don't need to practice with long phrases. And what you should find is if you do a little bit of this every day, you start to build that ability to launch into a phrase really, really quickly. Okay, I'm not overly concerned about how well I'm executing this, the accuracy of it. It's all about that launch point. Okay, this tip is huge. If you only take one tip away from this video, this is the one to go for. And it's to practice using your left hand only with hammer-ons. So what do I mean by that? If I was gonna take a phrase uh, such as this, for example, classic phrase for guitar players using pull-offs. You can practice this phrase using only hammer-ons with the left hand, okay? So I am going to mute the neck here because this tends to get a little bit noisy and I'm not worried about uh, muting that kind of, you know, in terms of my technique here, because I'm never going to play this way when I'm actually playing. But I'm going to mute the strings so they don't make too much noise. And I'm only going to play using hammer-ons on the left hand, okay? So I imagine, the analogy I imagine here is like when you see a chicken pecking at the ground, okay? Constantly pecking, then looking back and so on and so forth. You know, the way they look a bit crazy when they kind of peck away for worms and food and stuff. That is what you're going to be doing here. Each of these fingers these hammer-ons, is going to be a little bit like that chicken pecking motion. It's going to be quick and accurate, okay? It's really, really important. The pull-offs that you would normally execute, this they allow you to line the fingers up like this in a row and get very lazy with your left-hand technique because you can just pull away and the other fingers are already in place. With your hammer-ons, you can't do this because if you imagine hammering onto this seventh fret of the G string, you can't leave that finger in place and then hammer on to the fifth fret of the G string because this finger's in the way, it's not gonna work. So if I go, nothing happens. So I have to hammer on with my little finger and then get the little finger out the way at the exact moment that my second finger comes down. So it's this. If I just mute the strings here. Okay, so that's the technique. Now you can do this ascending, of course, because that's what you do when you ascend anyway. So you could turn this phrase around and go. But you can practice any phrase using left hand only hammer-ons. And I'll explain why it's super important in a second. So for example, if I was to improvise around, in this case, I'm sort of imagining myself back in C Lydian again. So that sound. If I now play. Now, 
And when I was younger, I don't do so much of this anymore, although I do do this when I need to. And when I was, but when I was younger, I used to practice this way a huge amount, sort of 2006 to 2008. And this, I would say, was the thing that transformed my legato playing from being pretty good to being really controlled from a technical and time-based perspective. Because you need so much control from a rhythmic and physical perspective to get each of these fingers out of the way when you're doing the pull-offs, or well, well not pull-offs, but when you're going backwards or descending, that it really, really develops this sense of control and time and accuracy. You can really concentrate on using those fingertips like a ballet dancer, like a touch typist, that kind of analogy again, to really get to grips with this technical approach. So I would sit and do this for quite some time, being, again, think strong, but relaxed. Think like a, um, you know, like a, a dancer rather than a wrestler. You're not wrestling with the guitar, you're dancing over the top of it. This is gonna be hugely challenging for many of you out there. This is gonna be almost like you can't play anything at first, especially when you're descending. But if you keep practicing this way, honestly guys, it is a huge, huge thing for your legato playing and will definitely take you to that next level. So the final tip, this one's a little bit shorter, is to do with not accenting your string changes as you cross over the strings. Unless you mean to, of course, unless it's a thing where you're doing it because you're in control. But if you're accenting your string changes when you're playing legato because you're not in control of the right hand, you just end up with a sound that literally sounds like somebody falling down a flight of stairs. It's not a good sound from the rhythmic perspective, okay? So if I start improvising around the key of G again, let's go for G major. My favorite key because of this. Coolest chord you can play on the guitar, in my tuning anyway. Um, if you start to improvise and your right hand is flailing and accenting every single, single string change, you get this kind of effect. Uh, it's just not pleasant. It's just notes popping out all over the place that don't make any sense. Whereas when I'm improvising, again, if I go for this key. So hopefully you can hear there that I'm not having all of these notes popping out uncontrolled. Of course, if I wanted to play, with all of those notes going crazy and popping up because that was the effect I was going for. That's cool. But if I'm doing it because I don't have the control to not accent those string changes and have this even sound, that then is a problem. So you need to practice very slowly, making sure that you're not pulling really hard or picking really hard when you do those string changes so that they're less obvious as you go through. So I hope you found those tips useful, guys. If you did and you would like to know more, of course, all of these things are expanded upon in my Modern Legato series, and you can practice all of them using my Ultimate Legato Practice Toolkit, the links of which you will find down below. Modern Legato parts one and two go through all of the stuff to do with time, subdivisions, the basics of the technique and control, and then Modern Legato part three, of which in total it's about seven or eight hours of tutorial content, you will find in Modern Legato Part 3 how to improvise with the technique, how to construct phrases, how to play through chord changes with this technique, that kind of a thing. So check that out below if you want to learn more about this particular technique. And then the Ultimate Legato Practice Toolkit is a series of 20 minute long workouts that you can utilize to help you develop some of these skills in a real world practice scenario that doesn't take too long to actually work through in your day. All right, guys, thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, as usual, hit the like and subscribe buttons. You know the, the rigmarole here, the spiel. Obviously hit the bell notification icon. You guys know how to use YouTube. Let me know what you think in the comments below, guys. If you've got any more requests for video content you would like to see me do, whether it's to do with playing the guitar or just gear generally or whatever, got lots more gear demos coming up soon as well. Lots more content. Again, thank you for the really lovely kind words. Sorry for the hiatus. My name's Tom Quayle and I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.